you can have a negative impact on world trade. Okay, so we go and pull some data for Colombia where we get some very nice detailed data, micro data. Uh, we know their currency distribution, again, heavy dollar invoices, both for all exports and for manufacturing exports. So let's start with the terms of trade. So remember here, so this is a cool picture because this is the Colombian peso relative to the dollar. And that's the commodity price. Uh, this says that this is a perfect mirror image of kind of it all moves one to one in the opposite direction, which is that when commodity prices are going down, the Colombian peso is depreciating. Okay. If you didn't know the if you didn't know the causal sign, you would say, well, this looks like Mandel Fleming. That when your the terms of trade depreciates, when your currency depreciates. But if you strip out commodity prices and look at the terms of trade excluding commodity prices then you actually get that the terms of trade is very stable, much more stable, consistent with the DCP paradigm, which is that you get a fairly stable terms of trade for these countries. Um, if I look at the pass-through into Colombian pesos, if the Colombian peso, so I'm looking at goods coming from the US into Colombia, and I look at the pass-through in uh, what this is basically doing is I'm not, it's, it's that equation being estimated, and this is the pass through in, in the first quarter, the second quarter, the fourth quarter, and the eighth quarter, and so on. This is saying that if the, if the Colombian peso depreciates by 10% relative to the dollar, uh, export prices in Colombian peso terms going to the US go up by eight percentage points. Uh, and then it comes down to settles at around you know, five percentage points or, uh, over there. If you do the same thing for the import side, this is the data, by the way. This is not the model. This is the data. What the data, again, says is that if I look at imports coming from uh, the US into the home country, the Colombian country, uh, the pass-through into the Colombian peso is 100% in the beginning, and it comes down. So this is a very specific testable prediction of the, of the world, which is that you want to generate that all pass-throughs start very high and then come down so much. So when you do that, and you, 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 when you use the model and you, you try to uh, see what happens in the dominant currency pricing world, that thing works extremely well. So that's the black line. The black line is the dominant currency pricing case, and it does so. Again, intuitively, in the extreme, what this is telling you is that if all Colombian imports coming from the US and all Colombian imports going to the US are priced in dollars, and those dollar prices don't change that much, then the Colombian peso price is going to move one to one with it, which is exactly what that is. You do much worse if you go to, uh, to uh, the Mandel Fleming world. The Mandel Fleming world does well on imports, but does badly on exports. Because according to the Mandel Fleming world, Colombian peso prices should be the ones that don't change that much, which means that the dollar pass through should be higher. And if you do the LCP world, you get, it goes terribly off on, uh, on imports. So these other two paradigms get it terribly wrong uh, on, on, the, on those dimensions. What's interesting is you can do that for imports and exports of Colombia with the rest of the world, excluding the US. And you get the exact same pictures. You get very similar pictures. Um, and again, DCP does well, while the others do, do quite badly. I just want me here, before I end, to show you one more, uh, one more table over here. So this is a very standard pass through regression, column one. It says that if I look at export prices going from H to region R, I would regress that on the, on the exchange rate between H and re region R. I mean, that's what a typical pass-through regression would do. Would be, if I'm looking at exports going from India to Mexico, I would look at the amount by which rupee prices change when the, Mexi when the Mexican dollar moves relative to, sorry, the Mexican peso moves relative to the Indian rupee. That's what you would do. But you could do the same thing, but instead of having only the, that bilateral exchange rate in there, you can also have the second column, which is that you can have the exchange rate of the Indian rupee relative to the dollar. Even though you know, the US is nowhere in that trading relationship, I can put that in there. And once you do that, it basically knocks out the other currency. So what it's basically saying is that what really matters, and this is true for prices, and we have the same numbers for quantities, it's true for imports and true for exports, that you really don't have, uh, that what really matters for pass-through both in prices and quantities is not the bilateral exchange rate, but the, but the currency, uh, but the dollar, exchange rate of the currency of the country relative to the dollar. 
Okay. So uh, most trade is invoiced in, in very few currencies. The dominant paradigm, DCP, uh, has those three features in there. Uh, I'll just take 30 seconds to explain why, if I were to endogenize currency choice, which is that I were to say that firms actually choose what currency to price in, then features two and three of the, D of the dominant currency paradigm actually uh, gives you a reason why you should expect to see pricing in a common currency. It doesn't say why that currency should be the dollar. But it says why you might want to do it in a common currency. Why? So it's saying that suppose everybody in the world is pricing in dollars. And I'm an exporting firm, and I'm deciding, and I'm an Indian firm exporting, and I'm deciding whether to price in dollars too. Uh, or, in, or to price in rupees or price in any other currency. If I have strategic complementarities in pricing, then again, I want to keep my price relatively stable relative to my competitor's price. If, I'm, if I don't get to change my price very frequently, I'm able to mimic that by keeping the prices stable in dollar terms. So that gives me a reason why I want to mimic what everybody else does. The second is imported inputs and production. What that says is that I'm an Indian firm I'm selling to the rest of the world. If the rupee depreciates, you would think, well, then my, uh, you know, my cost of production in dollar terms are changing by a lot, and so maybe I should change my dollar price by a lot. But no, but this Indian firm is also using imported inputs. And these imported inputs are invoiced in dollars. So when the rupee depreciates, their imported input costs in rupee terms go up. And so that offsets the desire to, to change prices when I sell uh, to, destined, to, to, to the US market. So that gives me another reason why I want to keep my prices stable in dollar terms. So in terms of implications, so the, again, the data strongly rejects PCP and LCP in favor of DCP. The implications are the monetary policy has a limited impact on exports in the terms of trade. The trade balance adjusts mainly through imports, not exports. Adverse shocks in emerging markets could reduce world trade. Inflation and import sensitivity to the dominant currency exchange rates far exceed the share of the dominant currency in, in uh, country in world trade. And that this has implications for spillovers of monetary policy arising in the US on the rest of the world, and the asymmetry of that spillovers, something that doesn't arise in those other paradigms. I think I'm good on time. Oh, I see. So, uh, what, what are the rooms again? 13, are any questions uh, from classroom 13? Classroom 14? Given that you, from your model you get uh, different impulse response functions, could you do a VAR analysis and compare that? Yes. So for the Colombian data, have you done that? And uh, we haven't, well, we've, uh, no, I mean, we haven't done it with a specific shock. No, so these are, re these are reduced from past through relationships. So the answer, simple answer is no. Uh, I mean, I'm partly, I mean, I partly have issues with the way VRs are done, but that, that's for another day, but yeah. But yes, in, in one implication of this would be simply to do a, a VAR impulse response to a monetary policy shock in Colombia or commodity price shock in Colombia. So you were discussing the use of dollar as both a numerator and as something in which payments are made. This, the second one I'm, uh, is irrelevant. It's irrelevant, but uh, I suppose uh, that is where the dominance of dollar is in practice. Uh, one could think of a scenario where there is coordination between G7 or G20, hypothetical, but suppose there is, and they uh, agree on using the SDR or something, which is a mix of many currencies as the numerator, yep. but make payments in dollars. So. Uh, uh, what I'm getting at is that that could lead to some more stability uh, in various things. Uh, yes, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. So an implication of this is, you know, people have talked about using the SDR for many things. I think this is the one thing that actually makes sense to use it for, which is that if indeed 
countries were to say, there was something that said, okay, we're going to switch from pricing our imports and exports in, in dollar terms to in terms of SDRs, then you would definitely get more symmetry in the, in the world. It's not perfect, but you would get more symmetry than just having the dollar. And that might actually be even be good for the U.S. because the U.S. does, I mean, having being this dominant currency is not all good for the U.S. either. So, uh, like, two quick questions, actually. The first question is that uh, you are working with, uh, like, kind of the framework is there of uncovered interested parity, actually, the model. So why we are not getting the famous Donbus oversuiting because both, most of the op open economy models get that Donbus oversuiting, actually. We are not getting here, the impulse response that you showed to us. And the second is that... Uh, what is the implication for the labor market? Uh, kind of, you can say the Mundel, Mundel Fleming world actually allows the price rigidity to be kind of in, using in the kind of line with the wage rigidity. So the moment you have a different uh, price framework, uh, the price rigidity is not having one-to-one -one mapping with the wage rigidity. It means because if you have a dominant currency paradigm, yep. so your prices are changing actually in rupee terms. But that's not going to pass into wage market because wages are sticky. So the Mundell Fleming world is having this two things like together. You have price stickiness and wage stickiness that goes hand in hand. You yep. have domestic, runs, uh, domestic prices rigid, domestic wages rigid. But domin a dominant currency paradigm is not having that. So these are my two questions. How you reconcile that and why we are not getting the overshooting that we expect to get. Okay, so uh, the question of, uh, I mean, I do have price rigidity and wage rigidity in this environment. The difference is that the price, the rigidity in which prices are set, the in, I mean, are, the prices are rigid in the in dollar terms when you set prices in international markets, but wages are assumed to be rigid in home currency terms. So it's in rupee terms, right? So we, so I do have the fact that there's rigidity in wages and rigidity in prices. And under Mandel Fleming, both prices and I mean, you don't even need wage rigidity in Mandel Fleming, but in case you wanted both you would have price rigidity and wage rigidity in home currency terms. While in my case, you would have a difference in, in the currency of invoicing. But, that, but I don't think that's a big deal. Um, I mean, the Don was overshooting and whether that actually is a fact in the data, is like, you know, <laughs> it's up for debate. It's, I mean, you, you, you get it, it's an implication of the overshooting model, but it depends upon the parameters that you put in over here. You can very easily get an environment where there's no overshooting and an environment where there's even undershooting. Uh, it's, not, it's not a fact that one is trying to match in the data. What you do want to get, what you do get, what you do have evidence for is the fact that the nominal exchange rate actually, I mean, does depreciate when you have a, a cut in interest rates. Now, in fact, if you look at what evidence people do have for nominal exchange rates, impulse responses, you actually get more of a hump-shaped response, which is you don't get, you know, yeah, I don't have any kind of a hump-shaped response, but you would actually get the fact that it depreciates and then depreciates some more, which would be consistent with failures of UIP and why you can get the changes go to go in the opposite direction. But. Okay, I think we're going to stop. Uh, let's give Deepa a big round of applause. <laughs> and you can continue talking with her outside, and we'll end the session here. Thanks very much.